From 1998 to 2013, I served as the rector of the only parish in our diocese that bears the name of Francis of Assisi. When I went to Holden, I knew very little about him, but over the course of those 15 years, I blessed a lot of pets. I even blessed at one point a donkey from Heifer Project. And I read several biographies of Francis' life, and over that time we developed a close friendship. I even had a chance to travel to Assisi during that time. And so I want to ask you this question today, all saints. What can a man from Umbria, who lived eight centuries ago, teach us about following Jesus in 2020? I hope you will stay with me as I try to answer that question today on the anniversary of his death. I know that many of you, perhaps everybody, has seen this familiar statue of St. Francis hanging around in gardens, hanging around as he is in this courtyard. He's pleasant enough. Usually there's a couple birds there chatting with him. Sometimes there's an animal sitting at his feet as he preaches the gospel at all times, sometimes even with words. You know, I'm sure, that he inspires us to care for this good earth, our fragile island home. And you know, I'm sure, the prayer attributed to him, even if he didn't actually write the words, he lived them. Lord, make us instruments of thy peace. But today I want to reintroduce you to him, and that begins by traveling back to the latter days of the 12th century, to the Umbrian town of Assisi, halfway between Rome and Florence. If you ever get there, Assisi sits up on a hill. It's obvious the roads were built long before the automobile was invented. And so you park at the bottom of that hill and you walk up and up and up to the narrow streets where you can almost imagine walking into good old Frank. No longer a statue, but a real person in a real time, in a real place. So in 1182, an infant boy was baptized at the cathedral font in that village. And his mother was a religious person who decided that she would name her son after John the Baptist, the one who prepared the way for Jesus. And so he was christened Giovanni, the Italian version of John. Francesco, which means little Frenchman, was the nickname that was given to him by his father, who loved all things French. In the latter part of the 12th century, Assisi was moving from a feudal society to a mercantile society. This led to clashes between the social classes and the old guard and the nouveau riche, merchants like Giovanni's father, who was a cloth trader who traveled regularly on business to France. So here's the deal. Francisco may have even traveled with his dad on a business trip during his teenage years, and if he did, and if they walked around Paris together, then he would have seen a new cathedral under construction that would be named eventually for the mother of our Lord, Notre Dame. He was, by all accounts, a spoiled rich kid. It happens sometimes when parents are upwardly mobile and when they indulge their children so that their kids will have all the opportunities that they never had. His father expected him to follow his path in the family business. Something happened, though, it's not exactly clear what, but something happened that changed his worldview. Some say he came down with an illness that left him bedridden for a long period of time. Whatever happened, he ended up in the military, and he decided to become a knight. When somebody says Semper Fi to you, you know that they are shaped by a whole set of values that makes that person a Marine. Well, knights in the Middle Ages were something like that, and the equivalent of Semper Fi was the notion of chivalry. Two core values for knights were a commitment to largesse, that is, to generosity, to give freely, and to always be courteous. Yes, sir. No, thank you, ma'am. I mention this because as profoundly as Francesco would be formed by the gospel, these military values also dovetailed in shaping the person that he was becoming, and they stayed with him. And if you ever sit down and read the rule of St. Francis, generosity and courtesy permeate that rule. Of course, they're gospel values. 
but they were also reinforced by his training as a knight. And then he has this powerful religious awakening in the church in San Damiano. While praying, he hears Christ calling to him, Francesco, rebuild my church. Some might call this a conversion experience. I prefer to think of such experiences as awakenings because they remind us it's always about God. It's about what God is doing in our lives, not the other way around. Or another way to say this is that at that cathedral font, baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Giovanni Francesco had already been claimed and sealed and marked as Christ's own forever. And it's not God's fault that he was asleep to that reality for so long. In any event, he finally wakes up. And when he does, he begins to quite literally rebuild that chapel in San Damiano like a good junior warden would do. Only later does it dawn on him that the work of rebuilding the church is not just about physical improvements to the building, but this work of following Jesus. So he gets religion. And as far as his father is concerned, he gets a little too much religion. So his dad calls up the bishop, who happens to be a personal friend who he has on speed dial, and he asks the bishop to talk some sense into this kid of his, who was beginning to take his faith a little too seriously. Part of what was happening was that his commitment to largesse was making him very generous with his father's hard-earned money. So if you've ever been to Assisi, or if you get there someday, I hope you will check out the fresco in the upper church, which captures a heart-wrenching moment on the town green. Francesco, his father, the bishop, and a whole bunch of nosy neighbors. I stood in front of that fresco for a long time trying to imagine the turmoil and the sense of shame and the sense of betrayal that both father and son must have felt that day on the public square when Francis went, as we might say, to fresco. He takes off all of his clothes and he hands them to his father and he says, now I don't have anything that belongs to you. I am as naked as the day I was born. You are no longer my father. My only father is the one I have in heaven. And the bishop is so embarrassed he takes off his chasuble and covers Francis up. There is incredible pathos in that scene. And I think we make a mistake if we turn our favorite saint into the hero of this moment and his father into the devil. It's more complicated than that. I imagine his dad, especially within the context of a changing world where there are increasing opportunities for those who are willing to work hard, as honestly, honestly wanting the very best for his son. The problem is that father and son do not see eye to eye on what is best and their core values clash in this moment and Francis has to live the life that he believes God is calling him to. Not live the life that his father would have him live. Families can be like that sometimes as we navigate our way from generation to generation. It's a haunting story for me, and over the years I've wondered if it isn't kind of an inverted story of the prodigal son. Instead of the father running out to embrace his son, Francesco's father seems almost to be recoiling in that fresco, as if he's asking, who is this kid? And what has happened to him? As a parent, I can't help but feel some empathy for the father, which is not the same as saying that he was right. Those of us called to the vocation of parenthood know there are two gifts we can give our children, roots and wings. And sometimes if we've done a good job on the first part, it's even harder to let go. We raise our kids, though, in order for them to become adults and to let them go and to give them back to the living God and help them to find their own way in the world and their own path. Nevertheless, for me, that fresco captures a moment 
that is so hard, and not just for father and son, not to mention the bishop, but for all of the rest of us who are eavesdropping on a very private family matter being played out in a very public square. It is a sad and heart-wrenching moment, at least it is to me. And yet, it is also so clearly a defining moment in Francesco's spiritual journey. This very public rift in a small town, I'm sure nobody that was there that day ever forgot that. But for Francis, at the heart of the gospel was this call to embrace poverty as a way to share in Christ's suffering, to be in solidarity with the poor. Many of us admire his commitment. Very few of us are prepared to do it. Francis is like that rich young ruler in Jesus' parable, except unlike the rich young ruler, he doesn't go away sad. He gives it all away in order to follow Jesus. His old man simply couldn't understand that after all the sacrifices he'd made to make life better for his son. So they go their separate ways. So far as we know, they never reconciled. And I sometimes wonder what that means for a person who has had this kind of heart-wrenching experience to pray, where there is injury, let me so pardon. I want to tell you about another snapshot in Francis' life. In 1219, he heads off to the Middle East during the time of the Crusades. War is always hell, but the Crusades were particularly brutal, as perhaps only religious conflicts are. And yet Francis goes down to Egypt, to the Sultan's palace. He meets with a caliph who is roughly the same age as he is, probably early 30s. And the Muslim leader, most likely a Sufi mystic, is fond of religious poetry, he's intellectually curious, he's on good terms with the merchants of Venice. And so they make an odd couple in this encounter, this monk and this sophisticated caliph. And they meet and Francis tries to convert him to Christianity, which does not happen. The caliph is quite happy with his own religion. Yet they depart in peace and they depart on good terms. In the heart of the Islamic world, in the middle of the Crusades, Francis bears witness to the love of God he knew in Jesus, but he also listens and he treats the other person with dignity and with respect. The word crusader literally means one who bears the cross. In the 12th century and to this very day, however, that word sends chills down the spines of people who remember the atrocities that have been done in the name of Christ, in the name of the cross, especially in the Muslim world. Our language is so easily manipulated, and that was true long before George Orwell wrote 1984. But Francis bore witness in the midst of a warring world to another way. He understood that a true crusader is not engaged in violence or degradation, but committed to nonviolence to following the way of the cross as a way of mutual respect and conversation and humility and of trying to be an instrument of God's peace in a warring world. When we risk interfaith dialogue with our neighbors by choosing not to wield power over them, but to bear the sign of the cross as a sign of hope and of our own humility, of our own vulnerability, we honor Francis when we take part in committing ourselves to rebuilding the church, literally and metaphorically, we honor Francis. But like all the saints, Francis points us to Jesus. And Jesus shows us the way to the living God. This world right now needs us not only to pray the prayer attributed to Francis, but to live it. Lord, make us instruments of thy peace. This world, where there is so much hatred and injury and discord and doubt and despair and darkness and sadness, needs us right now, more than ever, to be the church. For us to find ways to sow seeds of love and of pardon and of union and of faith and of hope and of light, 
and of joy. And then water those seeds and help them grow with God's help. It has been said that Francis is the most admired and the least emulated of all the saints. And so I invite you, in the next week, change that. Find some time to pray the prayer attributed to St. Francis. It's on page 833 of the Book of Common Prayer, or you can Google it. And then ask yourself, ask yourself, how is God inviting me to live this prayer as I make my way through these challenging times? Where can I sow a little love, a little pardon, a little union, a little faith, a little hope, a little light, all of which bring joy to our neighbors?